Welcome everybody. Good to see you. Welcome back to this series and happy Thursday. We're going to get started. So um, this is part five of Love, Sex, and Relationships in Jewish Tradition uh, with Rav Avi Strasberg. And today is Good Sex and Bad Sex. Um, it's been an amazing series. I'm excited about today's, um, today's episode. So um, a few upcoming events for you to know about. Uh, May 24th, which is Sunday, 12 o'clock, Mark Michael Epstein, Inside the Jewish Mind, Part 1, Jewish Monsters. May 26th, next Tuesday, uh, at 10 a.m., we'll be with Judy Klitzner. She'll be talking about brothers crying out from the ground, the biblical origins of our divided society. And May 27th, next week, uh, at 1230, Raphael Zarum, virtual Bible tour of the British Museum. That's going to be awesome. And just so you know, um, and I know some of you do, we are now currently in our CSP annual fundraiser. Thank you to all of you who have already supported CSP and already donated. Thank you so much. And please, if you haven't already, consider donating to CSP um, so we can bring back more programs like with, Ravi, with Rav Avi Strasberg and others. It's been an amazing series. We'd love to see her back. And also because there is some swag involved in supporting CSP. So um, please consider supporting. If you're not already on the email list, please email Ari at aricats18 at gmail.com. That's A-R-I-E-K-A-T-Z 18 at gmail.com. Subscribe to our new YouTube channel. I can put the link in the chat later. And with that, I'm going to introduce Rav Avi, and she'll talk about what we're going to do today. So Rav Avi Strasberg is the Director of National Learning Initiatives at Hadar and is based in Washington, D.C., she received her rabbinic ordination from Hebrew College in Boston and is a Wexner Graduate Fellow. She also holds a master's in Jewish education. Energized by engaging creatively with Jewish text, she has written several theater pieces inspired by the Torah and maintains Daf Yomi Haiku blog, in which she writes daily Talmudic haikus. And so with that, I will hand it over to Rav Avi. Uh, you're muted. Here, there you go. <laughs> Amazing. So great to be unmuted. Um, great. Amy, thank you so much for that. Uh, it's just been such a wonderful series. It's crazy at the beginning of this. Um, doing a series of five sessions virtual was a little bit daunting because normally in five sessions I would get to know you all so well and to do it from afar. Um, it's a bit of a shame and yet I really do feel like in sort of getting to um, see some of your faces every week even from afar I'm getting to know you. Um, and I feel like we've been through something together. So I, I'm excited to be in this last session with you. Um, this last session, as Amy said, is good sex, bad sex. This is the session where we really um, get down into it. And by we, I mean the rabbis, that the rabbis surprisingly get really um, detailed and vivid in their description of um, what makes good sex, what makes sex good sex, what makes sex bad sex, um, how often people should be having sex, how they should be having sex, um, that these are things that we might not think that the rabbis talk about, um, but they do talk about it and vividly. Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Last week, just as a reminder, we started moving into this topic. We were looking at the topic of sexual desire, um, and we noted that um, sexual desire oftentimes is referred to by rabbis um, sort of in code language, just as yetzer hara, the evil. And so the very fact that sexual desire is sometimes called yetzer hara, the evil inclination, already gives a little bit of an inkling about some of the feelings around um, sexual desire and how we're to relate to sexual desire. We looked at a number of different stories um, that I think, you know, there could be another series that I would always, that I've always loved to do, that would be called um, Rabbis Behaving Badly. Um, and we looked at a number of texts that could really go into the Rabbis Behaving Badly um, series of rabbis who finding this, themselves overcome by sexual desire do all sorts of crazy things, superhuman feats of strength. Um, but really what we see is a lot of fear around sexual desire, um, fear that it can be overpowering, that it can lead us to do um, things that are, that are problematic, lead us away from our relationships. Um, we also um, saw a lot that the sexual desire that we seem to be concerned about seemed to be primarily with men and not with women, that we were more concerned about like the male sexual desire as being something that um, can become overwhelming and too much. And at the same time, as we saw texts that really, I think, painted sexual desire in a bit of a fearful life, light of something to try to squash or stay away from, we also saw several texts that presented in a different way. We opened with that text with the student, um, the audacious student, Rav Kahana, 
hiding under his teacher's bed, under Rob's bed, and hearing Rob and his wife um, talking and laughing and enjoying each other um, during sex. And remember, the student said, wow, the master is like someone who has never tasted a cooked dish before, and then he gets kicked out of the room. But the point of that story was to say, certainly, um, that seems to be a story of sexual desire, um, and a story in which it really a sex positive story in which there seems to be a certain amount of enjoyment and intimacy happening in the sex between Rob and his wife. We also looked at a final text last week on the Yetzihara that said, um, if it were not for the Yetzihara, if it were not for the evil inclination, that all these important things would never happen. Um, children would never be born because there would have been no desire that led to the sex that created them. Buildings would not have been created. That sort of man's ego and arrogance to build and to drive actually creates positive things in society. So we saw some texts that both, I think, reflected positively and also negatively on how one should relate to sexual desire. Um, today's class is going to be a bit of the same in the sense that we're going to be looking at different sex texts. Wow. Pretty amazing. Um, we're gonna be looking at um, different texts that really speak to sex. But what I do wanna say is again, I just wanna emphasize if anyone at the end of this course asks you, what does Jewish tradition have to say about sex? What you should say is it says a lot of, it says a lot of different things. And that's what I want you to take away from this class is that there's not a one note answer to Judaism says X about sex, that actually it's complicated and nuanced. And you're gonna see a lot of those different perspectives in the text that we're going to look at today. Um, some of the questions we're going to be um, asking today are how often do the rabbis think that um, we should be having sex? Um, when should that be happening? What are their attitudes towards sex? Um, and what is the role of intimacy and pleasure in sex? Okay, so that's what you have coming for you. We're going to try something new today. Um, for our very last session, uh, we want to try to open with a little bit of um, talking together in breakout rooms. This will give you a chance just to um, connect with a few other people. It's, um, I've so appreciated that chat function and also it's even better when you get to hear each other's voices and hear each other's questions in live time. Um, so we're going to, Amy's going to, just in a moment, um, break us into groups of about um, four people or something like that. The question that I want you to discuss in your groups is this. If someone were to ask you, what are the rabbis have to say about sex, just from your own guessing or from what you know, what do you think the rabbis have to say about sex? I'm curious to get sort of a baseline for what we think um, the rabbis have to say, and then we'll see um, if the texts we look at confirm what you thought, if they surprise you, if they differ, and in what way. So the main question you wanna share in, in your group is, what do you think the rabbis have to say about sex? And if you all talk about all that and you still find yourself having a little extra time in your breakout rooms, you're only gonna be there for five minutes, so it's not so much time. Um, you can share, um, is there a particular learning from the course of the last few weeks that you're, you're thinking about and taking with you a text that has stuck with you? Okay, so we're about to get, um, Amy will do her magic and in just a moment, you'll be funneled into your breakout rooms. You'll have about a five minutes and then we'll come back together for the rest of the- And class. there'll be six, when we get down to the final 60 seconds, it'll notify you that you've got 60 seconds remaining that it's, that it's ending. So here we go. Coming. Just a second. Here we go. All right. Coming up. It's just going a little bit slowly, but it should be showing up. There we go. You can click that message that says to join your breakout session or breakout room. Anybody. Hi, Ada. You can join huh? the breakout room. Did you get a message that says join the breakout room? Yeah, it says seven. Where so you could, I don't see any 
I see people's names, but no faces. For those of you who have just joined Thank us, we're you. currently finishing up breakout rooms and Rav Avi will be right back with us in just a moment. I've lost my group. Um... It's okay. They're, everyone's coming back in just one minute. So. Okay. So we're past the, the 60 second because I lost who I was with. All right. They're coming back in, in about 50 seconds. Okay. Okay. Hey, David. Hey.
All right, everyone's coming back. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Hello. This was a nice Hi. visit. Yeah. Hi, Evie. Hello. Welcome back. <laughs> let's, get to, let's get back to uh, Rob Avi. Uh, that was fun. Hey. Hi, <laughs> Joyce. Welcome hey. back, everyone. I'm going to mute everybody again, so just a second. Let me unmute Avi. Where did you go? Here we go. There we go. All right. We are back. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, I just want to say for my sweet little corner of the breakout room that I was in, um, it was so nice to get to talk to a few of you and to meet you and to hear your voices. So I hope that it was as um, sweet for you in your breakout rooms as it was for me. And there's something so special about getting to actually um, hear people and for me to meet people for the first time after all this learning together. Um, okay, so I, um, you know, I would normally be so curious to hear what came up in your sessions. Um, you know, why don't you hear, this would be actually really interesting to me. Why don't you use the chat right now? Chat to me um, if you have, and I'm not, to be clear, I'm not promising to answer these questions, but I'm curious to know, what are your burning questions that you want to know um, as it relates to the rabbis and sex? The questions of like, what do the rabbis have to say about X? Or this is what I really want to know about. If you have any questions that are really on your mind, um, I'd love to see them in the chat now. And then we'll see, um, you know, if we'll hit any of those in the class. I'll just give you a moment to chat those. Okay, so perhaps you are chatting, perhaps you're not. Either way, oh, here we go. So Mimi has one. The husband pleasuring his wife, uh -huh, Beverly. How, who, when were the rules of family purity made? Um, we all thought that sex would take place in the context of a loving relationship, but do rabbis address the questions of lesbian or gay relationships? That's a great question, Chris. Um, are the rules of the Orthodox follow today Talmudic? Okay, lots of good questions. So Chris, I'll just say to you sort of straight off, um, the rabbis certainly, certainly in the times of the Gemara and generally today, um, the rabbis are assuming um, heterosexual, hetero, heteronormative um, relationships. They're also assuming um, relationships like married relationships. But so both in terms of sort of modern questions of like, well, what do they have to say about LGBT or queer relationships? And what do they have to say about sex outside of the marriage? Those were questions that the rabbis were just, were like, they were not addressing in any way. I will say for, at least on the, um, the LGBT queer relationship question, for me, my um, sort of full disclosure, none of you may know this, but I'm actually married to a woman. Um, so for me, my way of reading these texts is while the rabbis may be assuming um, a heteronormative framework, to me, the sort of the, the learning that I take from it, I apply across, um, across gender and across sexuality relationships. Um, I think we can read them expansively, though that's not the way the rabbis were um, intending them. Okay, um, Gail, we're going to specifically see this. What is the role of women in initiating and participating in sex? Um, Beverly, who is the expert who interprets the rules of family purity today? It's a good question. What do the rabbis say about variety of sexual behavior? Wendy, we're going to hit that off the bat. So you're going to get your question answered. What about prostitution? Okay, great question. So we'll have to do um, the follow-up five-part series that is only on sex to address all of these questions. Okay, I appreciate these. Let's go ahead and get started because we want to make the most of our time together and we'll see which of these questions we're able to, um, able to cover. So I've um, chatted into the chat the link to the source sheet today. Let me just drop it in one more time since we had some conversations since then. Okay, so there you go. You can go ahead and open up the source sheet if you need that on the Google on the Google. Okay, so we're on the very first set. Oh my God, how many times am I gonna do that in the class, the very first text? Um, so the very first text, before we can talk about how and where and what, we have to just establish um, sex as an obligation, sex as an obligation in the Torah. So let's look at the verse in Exodus that really establishes that obligation. So the context of this verse here, this is the first source. The context of this verse is, it's talking about if a man actually takes another wife. So he, in the times of the Torah, that was still permissible. It only became not permissible um, later on. But if a man takes another wife, he, the, Torah, the Torah then goes on to say, if he takes another wife, 
Onata lo yigra. So these words, she'ara, kisuta, and onata, it's very debated how to translate them. Um, for our purposes today, and often how they're translated, she'ara refers to food. He's still, even if he takes another way, he's still obligated to provide her with food. Kisuta, he's still obligated to provide her with her clothing. And onata, ona here, is a word that they're using to say he's still obligated um, to, to satisfy her, basically, to have sex with her. And actually, if you look at a ketubah, these three words, the man's obligation to the woman um, in the, the food, clothing, and sex are written into the modern day ketubah. And it stems right from the verse in the Torah. What's sort of ironic of putting this in the modern day ketubah is the context in the Torah is if a man takes another wife, he still has to um, uphold his end of the bargain to the first wife. But what's important for our purpose is straight out the Torah is saying a man is obligated to have sex with his wife and to have sex a certain number of times, but that's part of his obligations. Interestingly, you see that in the Torah's eyes, um, already one of the questions we should be asking that was raised is what is the role of the woman? Um, in the Torah's eyes, it's the woman doesn't seem to have an obligation to like, have sex with her husband or sexually satisfy her husband. It's in the Torah's eyes, it's one-sided. It's the husband to the wife. Okay, on this note of the obligation of sex, um, let's look at the second source together. This comes from the Gemara. It comes from Tractate Kedubot. And interestingly, the rabbis actually have a very detailed, um, you know, in terms of if you're wondering, like, what, what is the amount of, like, the number of times in a healthy sex life someone should be having sex? The rabbis spell it all out for you. So the rabbis say, Talmidim yotzim l'talmutorah shelo berashut shloshim yom. So students can go, um, they can, like, leave their wives and study Torah without permission for 30 days, which is to say more than they're allowed to be away. Oh, that link didn't work for people? Let me try it again. That's, let me try one more. Oh, it seems like so, a lot of people are in the Google Doc, though. So perhaps if, perhaps I think you had a PDF of it or tried the Google Doc again because people do seem to be accessing it. I just posted a PDF as well. Amazing. Okay. So hopefully that'll work. Um, so the idea here is a husband is allowed to be away from his wife for 30 days, meaning to not have sex with his wife for 30 days. And he's allowed to do that without asking permission. If he's going to be away any more than that, then he would have to get permission. Meanwhile, this reminds us of what story that we already learned together, Rabbi Akiva and Rachel, where he was away not for 30 days, he was away for 24 years, which just raises for us the fact that the fact that he was away for 12 years and another 12 years, there really is something um, at odds with rabbinic tradition that for 24 years, he and his wife were not sexually intimate. Even though then in that text, you can say explicitly, you can argue, well, she, it, he didn't do anything wrong because she explicitly gave him permission. But still the fact that, that that sex was not a part of their relationship for 24 years does seem to be at odds with um, what the rabbis are saying as part of a healthy relationship. Okay, so Talmud Dean students, they can um, be apart for 30 days, but otherwise they need to get special, um, special um, reshoot, special permission. Poalim Shabbat Echad, workers, they can be away um, from what, for one week from home. Otherwise, if they're away for more time, they have to get special permission. Um, and then it says, Ona ha the word ona, where it says a hu in, in um, Exodus, that a husband is obligated to wife with ona. And really, the word ona, um, often, even in modern Hebrew, ona is like a season. It refers to amount of time. So they're saying the amount of time or the frequency with which a man has to have sex in the Torah, now it's going to spell it out for all these different professions. So it says, um, men of leisure, kayali, men of leisure who don't work, they should have sex with their wives every day. Laborers, who presumably are a little bit busier in getting out of the house, they should have sex with their wives twice a week. Donkey drivers, who I presume are a little bit more on the road because of their donkey work, once a week. Camel drivers, who are perhaps going on longer trips so they're far away from home more, have to at least have sex with their wives once every 30 days. And sailors, who are presumably out to sea and away for longer periods of time, have to still have sex with their wives once every six months. This is the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer. And so you hear the rabbis breaking it down profession by profession, and really the criteria for how often a husband is obligated to have sex with a wife depends on um, his profession and how likely his profession is to take him far away from home. So if you're a sailor, you know, if you're a trucker, 
and you're on the road all the time, like, okay, we can't require you to have sex with your wife every day. Um, but what we're seeing here is that not only is there an obligation to have sex, but there's an um, obligation to have sex with a pretty regular frequency, sort of as frequent as possible. And I think what's so interestingly about the men of leisure, the tayalim, the ones who aren't working is, the fact that the rabbis say that they are to have sex with their wives every day, to me, seems to suggest that that might actually be the ideal. That in the ideal world, if you are in the same space together and you're available to each other all the time, um, if you have the time, if you're not busy with anything else, that that might be the idea. And it might be that other things keep you away and then we understand and we work with that, but that's sort of the baseline is sex is a really regular part of um, their relationship. And the other thing that I might just add, this is a little bit reading in, but on the question of where does pleasure fit into sex, is sex purely for procreation or is pleasure a part of it? I do wonder if the fact that the baseline is sex every day, it seems to me that the sex has to be going on just sex for procreation, that there has to be some element of sex for pleasure. Otherwise we wouldn't be, you would be requiring it sex at a certain day in a woman's cycle. But the fact that it's every day seems to say there's something beyond that. Okay, I'm gonna take a look at your questions in the chat now. Um, how does this timing requirement jive with family purity? So that's a difficult thing, Beverly. Um, I mean, it does have to jive. So Beverly is referring to um, the period of Nita where based around a woman's um, menstrual cycle, um, depending on how one keeps it, it might be seven days that they have to be apart. It could be 14 days that have to be apart. So I think that that would be, um, of course, this timing has to jive with that. Um, they're not suggesting. And so that could be hard that if you're a sailor and you're like home for three days every six months and you have an obligation to have sex, but at that time it falls during your women's, your um, wife's Nita period, that could be very difficult. Um, okay, Wendy says, but do the women have the same leisure availability, women who run a household raise children? Which is to say, okay, good. So this text is only concerned with when is the man available um, uh, what are the man's commitments that are, would prevent him? And Wendy is saying, well, actually, it seems like there's two people in this relationship, and we also need to care about um, her availability and, and her readiness. Um, that's, uh, that's a good question. That really, And so I, I think um, the way that you transpose this text to our times is, um, you know, you have to make it about both partners, that the question is figuring out what is the healthy rhythm in a relationship that works given both partners commitments and um, leisure and when they can find the time that there's sort of an ideal of how often and there's figuring out how to work that into both people's schedules um, but the rabbis don't really address that though really the rabbis are specifically addressing the man's obligation to have sex with the wife even though there not there isn't even an obligation on the woman's part to the man so they're not addressing that and um, beth says did rabbi eliezer consider himself one of the men of leisure or a laborer that's a good question i don't know offhand certainly um can't imagine he considered himself a man of leisure because he was certainly like a Torah scholar. Um, a lot of the rabbis had professions. I don't know offhand what Rabbi Eliezer's profession is. I, for me, I understand a man of leisure as being like, um, what's a nice way of putting this? Um, I don't have a nice word, so I'm not gonna say it, but like, you know, the one who doesn't have a job and is just sitting around all day, if you're doing nothing and not contributing in any way, you should be, this is, this is the thing that you should be doing. Um, so I don't imagine that Rabbi Eliezer was under the once a day. Um, I'm not sure what exactly, certainly, I also don't imagine he was like a sailor either. <laughs> Some middle ground. Um, what if the wife does not want to have sex that often? Retirees illness. Okay, so that's a good question. So Susan, let's, um, let's come back to that. I think, Susan, what I would say there, just sort of preliminarily, is the way I understand this, this is, this might be reading into this, this text. I want to read this as, this is, minimally the man's obligation to have sex with his wife because he has an obligation to do that. And I want to presume of the text that that's assuming the woman wants it. But if there are other contributing factors and she doesn't want it, well, then she could say, no, not at this time. But we'll see that. We'll come back to this question in other texts. David says, can this regularity also mean being intimate with your partner in ways other than sex? Yeah, that's a great question. And also, what is the relationship to intimacy and sex. Um, I think, David, that's certainly the way I would want to expand this text to be, that there are, that there, you know, we're thinking, I think the rabbis are thinking probably about a pretty traditional notion of sex, although we are going to see in another text um, that there's actually sort of a debate of what is the relationship between intimacy and sex. And so I think depending on how you understand that, that might affect how you read this. But I think for our reading of it, I think that that's a really good question, an important reframing of, of what this might mean. Um, that maybe it's not about sort of a, a sharp 
you know, you have to have sex every, every three days, but uh, that actually intimacy in some way is an important and regular part of the relationship and figuring out how to fit that into a busy schedule um, as part of a couple's work together. Wendy says, if no obligation, are women free to say no? Yeah, so that's, um, I'm trying to think, are there texts? I mean, what I want to say there, Wendy, is yes, that the, 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 the Torah and Talmud, it comes down pretty hard on rape. Um, so I just want to say like, yes, women are free to say no. I think that that's actually pretty clear. We're going to see a text at the end that's, that I think will speak to that. Um, I think for me, the question more is, what is a woman's role in initiating? What is the woman's role in desire? But can a woman say no? I, I want to say, yes, she can say no. Um, that said, you know, thinking of the Roman Orthodox, there are, uh, there are a lot of pressures around um, reproduction that make it, could make it harder to say no, even though technically she can. Um, okay, I'll take Faith's question and then we're going to move on. Um, the question of having sex during war came up. What did the rabbis say about that? Oh, I assume that that's a question. Faith, can you clarify what that question is? Is that about people being away or having sex during a time where it's actually perhaps inappropriate because there's a lot of hardship and suffering? Maybe just clarify what that question is. I think Faith, um, while you, if you're able to, to clarify that question, I'll come back to that maybe when I do the next set of questions. And if I forget, just remind me in the chat to come back to that question. Okay, so now that we've established the obligation of sex and sort of the regularity, let's look at how sex is actually supposed to be performed. We're gonna see some really interesting texts. So take a look at the third text. Basically, we're gonna look at a series of texts from um, the tractate, just one second. Sorry for drinking on camera. Okay, we're gonna look at a series of texts from the tractate on Nidarim. And we're gonna hear some strong opinions from Rabbi Yochanan ben Dahavai. So we're on the third text. So Rabbi Yochanan ben Dahavai said, the ministering angels told me four matters, which is hard to say Rabbi Yochanan ben Dahavai has an um, intimate relationship with angels where angels are able to communicate things to him. So that's very nice for him. So he said, for what reason do people that are, um, so I just want to say as a disclaimer to this text, this text is really problematic from a disability perspective. It says the text assumes um, that people who are disabled in a certain way, that this is like a negative thing that we don't want. I want it with your permission, um, sort of bracket the fact that this text from that perspective, a disability conversation is a very problematic and, and could be a offensive text, um, but sort of see the questions that they're asking. So. Um, for what reason do people who are lame come into existence, meaning people who are unable to walk? And the answer is, it is because their fathers overturned their tables. In Hebrew, shehofchim et shulchanam, a metaphor for overturning their tables. This seems to be um, a nice way of saying that they're having sex in some sort of like, I guess, non-missionary position. They're having sex in some sort of, whatever the, the set table way of having sex is, they're having sex in some other way. And by having sex in some other way, that causes the children to um, come out, you know, with this disability of, of not being able to walk. For what reason do mute people come into existence? People who are unable to speak. It is because their fathers kiss that place of nakedness. In Hebrew, that's mipnesha minashkim al otoa makom. Otoa makom literally means that place. And it's often a euphemism um, that is used for talking about the, you know, the female part there. <laughs> I guess I'll stick with the euphemism there. Um, but anyway, the idea is that, that there be, the people are not the children for um, fathers who are um, doing this sort of kissing during sex, or presumably this is like code for oral sex here, um, that children are born mute. For what reason are people who are deaf come into existence? That's because their parents converse while engaging in intercourse. So this is to say, no talking during sex. Okay, according to Rabbi Yochanan Dahavai. For what reason do people who are blind come into existence? Um, it is because their fathers stare at that place. So according to um, Rabbi Yochanan ben Dahavai, first of all, he has some very specific views of what sex should be and should not be. And for those who are having sex, 
um, in ways that they should not be having sex, that it actually results in impacting the child that comes of the sex. So I wanna get your um, responses to this. According to Rabbi Yochanan ben Dahavai, if we only had Rabbi Yochanan ben Dahavai, what should sex look like? Go ahead and chat that. Okay, so we have boring, very mechanical, silent sex. It's true. It's nice to see that for once they aren't blaming the mother. That is definitely true, right? Only missionary position. It certainly seems to be like a functional sex that seems to be purely about sex for the sake of, I assume, procreation. It doesn't seem to be particularly pleasurable. Sex that is sort of wrapped up in any sort of desire, desire that is about attraction or looking at that place or the intimacy of conversing with your partner, that seems to be um, off limits. It's sex for the distraction, as David says, right? It's sex to the, the point and the purpose of having the sex, I assume, for procreation, very specific. Seems, and so Edward says, seems inconsistent with notion of intimacy for the sake of pleasure. I agree, Edward. Right, Rabbi Yochanan ben Dahavai does not seem to be interested in pleasure. So you'll be happy to know he's not going to be the final word on sex. Okay, let's read on a little bit. Um, this is for my small breakout room. I think this is, I think Beth was asking for this text, but this was someone in my, in my breakout room was asking for this text so that we have it. Um, okay, so that's Rabbi Yochanan ben Dahavai. Also, there's some problem of talking with angels. Okay, I'm not going to address that right now. But yeah, that's a different year. Sometimes the rabbis are in conversation with angels, but that is um, an interesting part of this. Um, or a mean who. We have a contradiction, which is to say, Rabbi Yochanan ben Dahabai taught all of these teachings about um, what sex should be like. And now the Gemara is saying, wait a second, this, this doesn't jive with something that we already learned. So what did we already learn? Ima Shalom, the wife of Rabbi Eliezer ben Hirkanus, was asked. So here is a named woman in the Talmud being asked, for what reason are your children so beautiful? And she said to them, my husband does not converse with me. Well, this is actually not a good translation. In the Hebrew there, it says, It's interesting, the word um, normally can translate to, um, to talk with me, but really talk is being used as a euphemism for have sex. Meaning to say, why are your children so beautiful? She's saying, because he doesn't have sex with me at the beginning of the night, and not at the end of the night, but rather at midnight. I think the idea there is that he has sex with her at the darkest time of the night, not when people are around sort of at like dusk or twilight and not in the early morning when people could be waking up or there's some light, but specifically at midnight is when they have sex. And then she goes on to say, and when he's having sex with me, he reveals a hand breath of my body and covers a hand breath. And he covers himself up as though he was being coerced by a demon and is covering himself out of fear. So she describes this, first of all, they only have sex in like the dead of night at midnight. And the uncovering, un uncovering seems to be like he uncovers the necessary bit of skin and then covers it up, covers the next necessary bit of skin and then covers it up. And then also this language of um, and he's similar to one that is being forced by a demon. That's what her husband's like. Then she says, so she says to her husband, then on Martilo, I said to my husband, this rabbi, Ma ta'am, why are you acting like this? And he said to me, it's so that I will not set my eyes on another woman. And it will turn out that my children are like Mumser. So let me explain that. Basically what he's saying is, um, if a man has sex with a woman outside of marriage, then the children of that marriage are considered um, mumsers, and that's like a problematic status for a person to have. Um, so, and the idea is, if while he's having sex with her, he's thinking of another woman, that even though that's not technically wouldn't, wouldn't affect his children, but just he's like so afraid of not, he doesn't want to be thinking of other women that he's having sex with her in this way. So it's very interesting because it, first of all, it's interesting because the rabbis are asking a woman about her sex life and she's answering. They're not, they could have asked Rabbi Eliezer ben Hirkanus, but they're asking the wife for some reason. And second, she's reporting on their sex life. She's saying, well, why are my children so beautiful? Why did the kids turn out so well? 
because he's uncovering and uncovering a little bit um, and he's doing it very quickly. But what she's revealing is that in the middle of sex, she sometimes stops and says, and, and questions him about his behavior and says, why are you doing it this way? And then he responds, which I think, even though I'm, I'm not sure I love um, sort of the, I'm not sure it's a particularly sex positive um, image of, of how he's doing it, of being chased by a demon. Um, I think it's really interesting that it, it allows for um, this conversation to happen, that she could say like, actually what you're doing doesn't feel great or seems confusing, or I'm not sure I love that, the fact that you seem like you're being chased by a demon. And there's a response with it. There's actually like a back and forth during the moment of sex, which can be so hard to have. Anyway, the point of this text is to say, why is this text a problem for the first rabbi, for Rabbi Yochanan ben Dehavai, who said, no, um, no talking during sex? Because it seems like, according to Ima Shalom, that she and her husband sometimes talk during sex, that while they're having this sort of crazed sex, she'll stop and ask him about it, and he responds. So that's a problem for the first rabbi. And then the Gemara resolves it and says, lo kasha, this is not a problem. These texts don't contradict each other. Ha bemili de tashmish, ha bemili acharyanta. So the one of them, what, what you are not allowed to do during sex is talk about things that have nothing to do with sex. When Rabbi Yochanan ben Dahab, I said no talking during sex, he, what, this is how the, the, the Gemara is rereading it, trying to resolve this contradiction. They're saying what he was talking about is like talking about like, by the way, did you pick up the groceries while you're having sex? What is okay is talking about sex while you're having sex. Okay, that was a lot. I want to allow you to respond to that. What do you think of Ima Shalom um, and her story about her husband? But if this, was, if this is all we had about sex, what should sex be like? Um, what does the story raise for you? I mean, what's, what's so striking about it is you have a woman being asked to report on her sex life. That's actually very interesting. And a woman who in some sense is not, she's not the silent fixture, figure. She's like actually sort of speaking up about it, both to her husband and to these other rabbis. Mm hmm So Amy says they are focused on sex and, and not anything else. Which I think, you know, yeah, which is, it, it is an in, interesting and good takeaway that part of what, what the rabbis are saying at the end is it's not that you can't talk, is that the talking has to be focused on what's going on. We want both people sort of in this moment together, focused on each other, right, question mark. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on and see a little bit more text together. Um, so the takeaway I would say both of, even with the difference between um, Ima Shalom saying, well, there actually is some talking going on. Yeah, it's so interesting. We keep coming back to this. Um, it, so it's okay for a woman to be fantasizing about something else. Yeah, I wouldn't say that. It's that what I think if you're taking something away, it's that we're actually so, the the rabbis seem more concerned about the man's behavior and the man's motivations. It's like, we're not, you, you can't necessarily make that assumption about a woman. It's like, they're not even considering what the woman might be doing. Um, so it's hard to project onto that. Um, the concept of a woman questioning the man's adolescent attitude. Okay, um, so let's go on. But the takeaway from this text is certainly there seems to be, while there allows for some sort of conversation, perhaps suggest a focusing on the sex itself um, in the moment, both of these texts seem to um, suggest like a, a covering up um, and sort of sex in a way that almost does feel like towards the purpose itself. That's not really about, doesn't seem to be about pleasure in these moments. Okay, let's look at um, the next text together. So this comes from um, the Tractate of Kitibot. So Rav Yosef taught She'ara, when the Torah said that a man was advocated in She'ara, which I had actually translated to remember to provide her with food, clothing, and sex. And I said, Shera was food. I also said that people are not sure how to translate and this sometimes gets translated as totally different things. So here, Rab Yosef actually translates a man's obligation to her not as Shera as food, but as Kiru Basar, which means intimacy. That's about like intimacy, like naked intimacy of the flesh. That's about sort of like a, 
a sort of like a naked cuddling. So he says, Kirup Asar is, is um, and I think it might be distinct from sex. So David, that goes to um, your question there. So he says, what is She'ara? This refers to the closeness of the flesh. And it teaches that he should not treat her in the manner of the Persians who have sex in their clothes. We don't want to do that. The Gemara comments, this supports the opinion of Rav Huna. As Rav Huna said, um, I'm going to read this for you in the, in the um, Aramaic Hebrew. The one who says, I will only have sex, me in my clothes and her in my clothes, he has to divorce her and give her ketubah. So this text presents a totally opposite, talking about having different perspectives from the same tradition. This text is saying, not only is there an obligation for this intimacy that's about a closeness of flesh, um, but anyone who says, again, we're focusing on the man, any man who says, I'll only have sex with my clothes on and with her clothes on, it's actually grounds for divorce and he's obligated to divorce her. So presents it in terms of like, what does sex look like for Rav Yosef? I think it presents a totally different type of picture of what sex looks like. From Yochanan and Dahabe, we got a sex that felt really impersonal, mechanical, um, had to be clothed, no looking. And this is presenting um, sex or perhaps some other sort of intimacy um, as much more of an intimacy that's about closeness and coming together, bodies coming together and sharing the sp same space, as opposed to, you know, getting the act done for the sake of procreation. Um, Let's read, let's do one more text together and then I'll take comments all together on this. So now we're gonna see a completely different type of text. So, um, okay, let's go to the text from sexual source number five. So this comes from Tractate Nidarim. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Zodi Rei Rabbi Yochanan min Dahavai, aval amru hachamim ein halcha ke Yochanan min Dahavai. So Rabbi Yochanan says, these are the words of Rabbi Yochanan min Dahavai who said all these positions are off limits and all these things are off limits. But the sages say the halakha, the law does not follow him, right? They say it really explicitly. That was this guy. We don't follow this guy. Rather, what do we do? Um, anything that a man wants to do with his wife, he can do. Mashal, this is a parable to, Mashal um, basar. this is a parable to meat. Habame beta tabach. The one who gets food from a butcher, if he wants to eat it with salt, he can eat it with salt. If he wants to eat it roasted, he can eat it roasted. If he wants to eat it cooked, he can eat it cooked. If he wants to eat it boiled, he can cook, eat it boiled. And the same thing with fish that comes from a fish. So this text presents a totally different idea, whereas Rabbi Yochanan Medahabai and even um, Ima Shalom was presenting a pretty prescriptive format of sex. I was like, it had to be done only in these specific ways. If you go off course, it's totally off limits. This is a view of sex that is everything is on the table and anything a man wants to do, one can do. Okay, I'm so curious to hear how do you respond to this text? What do you think about this text? Do you like this text? Do you hate this text? What are your questions about this text? It's pretty um, sensational, this kind of analogy. And also, I'll remind you um, of the text with Rav Kahana and Rav, where Rav Kahana said, it's like he's never tasted a cooked dish before. This is another text of thinking about like sex as relating to food and meat and, you know, cooked meat. Right, so Faith says, there's no basis in science for these admonitions with Rabbi Yochran ben Nahabai, of course. Muriel says, I don't like a woman being compared to a piece of meat. I agree with you, Muriel. Right, on one hand, you could read this as being very sex positive, but it's also like it's comparing a woman to a piece of meat. So to the extent that in the other text, you felt like women's voices were absent, all the more so in this text. Very oral. Right. Um, Gail says, again, hate it, so one-sided. <clears throat> I think the question with this text is, it's a question, but I'm not sure how much of a question is, you could read this text as being sex positive of anything a man wants to do with his wife, and then you could read expansively as this is permission for both partners to be explorative and to figure out what works best for them, or do you read it as, no, it's actually about the man's needs and wants. It's not clear from the text. Lots of food analogies to food, hunger, desire, sustenance. So David, again, says with the partner's consent, good. So we have to make sure we get to that. Okay, where is the woman in this, her wants? Okay, so I think that we have to make sure that we get, we have to balance this text with our last text. I wanna make sure that we see that right now.
So let's take a look at the very last section. Skip to um, source number six. This comes from Tractate Nadarim. So in Tractate Nadarim, it references a verse from Ezekiel that says, I will purge out from among you the rebels and those that transgress against me. And Rabbi Levi said, who are these peoples, who are these people that um, God is purging out, the transgressors? These are the children that are born um, defective con from conception um, because they are born as a result of um, these like nine different problematic sex unions. So basically who are the transgressors? These are the children that are born of, of sexual unions that are problematic. And now the Gemara is gonna list the nine different problematic um, ways that people have sex. These are the things that we don't want, okay? I'm just gonna read them in the Hebrew and then I'll translate it. B'nai e'ma, um, these are children that are born of fear, meaning children that are born of sex where there is fear associated with the sex. B'nai anusa, children that are born of rape, children that are born in a situation where the, um, the wife has been raped. B'nai snu'a, children that are born where there is hate in the relationship, where between the two partners, I mean, really it's, I'm, I'm making it um, gender neutral. I'm already doing the work of like making it sort of expansive to talking about partners. Really what it's saying is where the woman has been raped or the woman is hated, um, but children that are born where there is hatred in that sex, that that is a problematic form of sex. Benaini, do we children that are formed where one or the other members have been um, formally excommunicated by the community? So that's sort of in a different category. Benait Mora, um, children that are born of a sex where there's where um, the when they were thinking about the sex, the man was actually thinking about another person. Benai Revi Meriba, children that are born. Um, during a fight or during a quarrel, meaning that while the, while the people were having sex, there was some sort of fight or quarrel that was going on between them. B'nai shichrut, children that are born from sex that was about drunkenness, that the partners were drunk when they had sex. B'nai grushat halev, this is a really interesting one. Children that are born when there's already been a separation of the heart, where again, really, I think it's talking about the man has decided he wants to divorce the wife. But if we want to expand this to make it more um, applicable, you know, to both partners, children that are born from a union where like one or the other partner has already decided that this is not a relationship that they want to move forward with, but they have sex anyway. Um, B'nai Yerbuvia, children that are born of sort of like a polygamous sexual encounter. And B'nai Chatsufa, children that are born uh, Chatsufa uh, from a union where the wife was the one that initiated the sex. So all of these are, for, I would leave behind the impact on the children for now, but what the Gemara wants to tell us is these, all of these forms of encounters with sex are all problematic and we don't have. And so this is why, like to all, to all of your questions about where's the woman in this, on one hand, I totally echo you that these texts that we've looked at are very male focused about male needs, male wants. On the other hand, this is actually a really important um, text in terms of saying any union where there is fear is not an okay union. It is not a permissible union. Any union that is rape, God forbid, not a permissible union. Any union, even where there's like a lack of love, where there's been a, a cutting off, there's a separation in the heart, or there's fighting, or there's drunkenness, are not okay unions. Um, I think that this is all all very interesting. The question that I would ask you, which unfortunately I don't have time to hear your comments, but I would love to is, what is surprising about this list? And if you were making your own list, what would you want on this list? This is the rabbi's list, but what would you put on this list? That unions that you think are, um, that are unhealthy unions, and what are the healthy unions? This is the rabbi's list of unhealthy unions. I mean, I just think it's so the fact that there's the B'nai Ema, children that are born from sexual encounters where there's fear, that the rabbis are including both. They're not just saying rape is off limits, but they're saying even if the woman feels fearful, that is also problematic. We don't even want to get to that point. I think that this text is really important. I want to briefly just, for the sort of the humor part of it, and also because someone asked, I want to address the last point, the Chatsufa, children that are born where the woman initiates sex. That might be a problematic one for some of us. So then the Gemara goes on and says, but really? Is that really true? Didn't Rashmul Bar Nachmani say that Rabbi Yonatan said, 
Any man whose wife demands of him that he engage in sex with her will have children the likes of whom did not even exist in the generation of Moses, our teacher. Which is to say, this other rabbi said, wait, but I actually heard any woman who initiates sex ends up having children that are even greater than Moshe. Which is to say, absolutely, a woman should initiate sex, they'll have amazing children. How do they resolve it? Low cost, yeah, it's not a problem. When we said that she can initiate sex, it's so that he, um, she has to do it in a way um, that she's sort of like enticing him implicitly. So what a woman, according to the resolution here, is not that a woman demands sex explicitly, but can sort of entice him implicitly and let her know. So the Gemara ends up finding a way um, to resolve it. But it's interesting because you see, on one hand, you have this women should never initiate sex. That's like, that leads to these problematic unions. On the other hand, you actually have a very strong sex positive statement for women of, you know, they will have children not born in the likes of um, children even greater than the generations of Moshe. Okay, um, I want to, with our last minute, give you some space to chat into your chat, your comments, um, thoughts, responses on this. Uh, Gail, is that to protect the ego of men that couldn't perform the, um, that a woman shouldn't be demanding sex, I assume. I mean, I, I think that's an interesting question. I think it's like the, the rabbis just only really see men as, as you can see, the rabbis only see men as the initiators. So the fact that a woman would be the one initiating, I think puts the man in this emasculated role. I think in the rabbis, at least in this one rabbi's position, the other rabbi says, actually, no, it's an amazing thing, absolutely. David said, all of these are examples of disconnection between souls. Sex can and should be engaged with our higher selves, not merely with our corporal selves. David, I love that. That's just such a beautiful way of summing it up, that these are texts in which part of what's, what, I, what I so appreciate um, about this last text um, of all of the unions that are problematic is it really, it were, it's talking about the negatives, the disconnection, but really we want to look at it in the inverse of like, well, what is the positive way? What are we that we want? It should be about two people communicating, coming together. It should be in love. Um, it should be in consent. It should be of right minds that there's not some sort of like people are not in that and that all of it from the negative list, I think we can write the positive list. Rena, it's such a good question. Um, why is it that the punishment forbidden sex is on the children and on the people? I can't properly address it in 20 seconds. Like that's a longer thing. I think what I want to say about that, the way that I want to resolve, the way I understand this, because I think otherwise it's a super problematic text, is is not about like you have inappropriate sex and then your kids end up with some sort of disability, which is already getting into like problematic offensive text. But that um, there's in that sex that is comes from God forbid rape or fear or any of these really strong forms of disconnections has sort of like a spiritual impact on the children in a very real way that a parent, whether a parent's relationship is healthy or unhealthy, this has an impact on the children. The language of the children being punished, that's like a whole sort of a whole other, the children being purged as transgressors feels very problematic, but the language of um, the, sort of the sacred, the sacredness of the union affecting the children, I think that's something um, that I can resonate with. Okay, I have to end here for the sake of all of your times. I just want to, I'm sorry that this last class, there was so much to squeeze in. I really want to thank you um, for being a part of these sessions. I want to thank you so deeply for diving into these um, really interpersonal topics and doing it in this virtual medium and for making the use of the chat. We couldn't have had this kind of um, learning without the chat and without me getting to hear some of your thoughts. Um, and I just look forward to a time when I get to do some more learning with you. Um, hopefully hear your voices and um, get in deeper with some of these topics. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rav Avi. Just a second, I'm just getting back over to you. Um, so I can, there you are. Um, a few people have asked where we can get recordings of these sessions in case you missed any of them. All of them are posted on our YouTube, our new YouTube uh, channel, which I am posting a link to in the chat right now. There you go. Should go to everybody. Computer is acting a little slow. There it is. Okay, that's a link to our YouTube channel. So please subscribe to it and check it out. And you will see the first four sessions that we had with Rob Avi are posted up there. This was session number five um, of the five part series. It has been a great series. I've really loved learning with you, Rob Avi. And I really do hope that we get to have you back soon. So thank you so much. And thanks everyone for participating. And um, Hope to see you again on Sunday with Mark Michael Epstein. 
um, and next week with Judy Klitzner and Raphael Zarum. So um, have a great week and um, stay safe and healthy. Bye, everybody.